Welcome back in the previous lesson, we learned about psychoanalytic theory. In this lesson, we're going to explore a very different school of thought called behaviorism. You might not be as familiar with behaviorism as you are with psychoanalysis, especially if you're not a psychology professional. But within the field of psychology, behaviorism reigned supreme for half a century, from the 1910s to the 1960s. If you mention behaviorism during that time, it was synonymous with psychology. In fact, behaviorism hasn't faded into obscurity, its theoretical principles and research methods are still relevant today. Behaviorism finds applications in various aspects of our lives, from advertising to gaming, and it's highly effective. By the end of this lesson, you'll see why. However, in my opinion, behaviorism is a double-edged sword. It can provide tremendous help to individuals, but it can also lead to unforeseeable harm. Therefore, when you study behaviorism, it's crucial to approach it with a critical perspective. I can summarize this school of thought with three key words, simplicity, effectiveness, and dominance. Understanding these words will help you comprehend why I make this judgment. The simplest psychological idea let's start with simplicity. Behaviorism might be the simplest of all psychological ideas. It reduces all psychological phenomena to two concepts, a stimulus and a response. By connecting stimuli and responses, behaviorism claims to explain everything. What does this mean? Let me give you an example. There's a famous, popcorn experiment. Researchers in a movie theater gave people free popcorn and observed how much they would eat while watching a movie. Naturally, you'd think people would stop eating when they're full, right? But in the experiment, some people were given popcorn in two different sizes of containers both larger than what a typical person could consume. Surprisingly, those with the larger containers tended to eat more before stopping. In terms of terminology, the size of the container is a stimulus, an external, objective fact. The amount of popcorn you eat is your response. In this experiment, people didn't base their judgment of being full on inner experiences but were influenced by external conditions. If the container was large, they unconsciously ate more. This experiment helps us understand the core of behaviorism, your responses are determined by external stimuli, not inner experiences. It's a somewhat counterintuitive conclusion. While other psychological schools still played cards at the table, debating what's going on in people's minds, whether conscious or unconscious, behaviorism flipped the table. It said, we don't need to look inside the mind. We only need to examine the external stimuli and responses, that's what matters. You can imagine the controversies behaviorism stirred when it was first introduced. Traditional psychologists argued that the human mind had so many complex activities. How could you ignore it and reduce humans to mere stimulus response machines? Behaviorists countered by saying that these so called higher mental functions, like thoughts, emotions, and will, might not even exist, they could be just our own illusions. They reached this conclusion by accumulating extensive research in animal behavior including the famous, Four Horsemen of Behaviorism, Pavlov's Dogs, Thorndike's Cats, Skinner's Pigeons, and Tolman's Rats. These studies will be elaborated later, but for now, remember their key idea, lower animals, after training, could also produce specific responses to specific stimuli. For example, when Pavlov rang a bell, his dog salivated. As the famous Occam's Razor principle suggests, entities should not be multiplied without necessity. Behaviorists argued that if lower animals could respond to stimuli, why would humans need to invoke more complex and higher mental processes? This way, behaviorism simplified psychology into the connection between external stimuli and responses. All you needed to study was what responses a person would give under specific stimuli. What happened internally didn't matter. The power of behaviorism How well does behaviorism simplicity work? This is my second point behaviorism is a very powerful school of thought. From the outset, behaviorism aimed to provide effective assistance to people. Its founder, John B. Watson, an American, introduced two major goals in his first, behaviorist manifesto, to predict and control behavior. He said, if we can deduce, given the external conditions, what responses an individual is likely to make or if we can manipulate an individual's behavioral performance by controlling external variables, this is the value of science to mankind. 
let's go back to the popcorn experiment. What kind of power do behaviorists hold? Since we discovered the link between container size and consumption, we can make two predictions. First, based on the container size, we can predict whether you'll eat a lot or a little. Furthermore, we can alter the design of the container to make you eat more or less. During the heyday of behaviorism, people believed that this kind of psychology could more efficiently help individuals. In psychotherapy, the treatment of any psychological disorder could be broken down into, increase some good responses to specific stimuli and decrease some bad responses. If someone is anxious when faced with an exam, the behaviorist perspective would consider the exam as the external stimulus triggering these anxious responses. The goal of treatment is to help them react with more relaxation and confidence when faced with such stimuli. Behaviorist therapists developed a technique for this scenario called systematic desensitization, which I will explain in later lessons. With this method, significant improvements could be seen within weeks, making it highly effective. It's no wonder that behaviorism often poked fun at psychoanalysis, saying, for the same symptoms, if you seek psychoanalysis treatment, you might just be starting to recall your infancy, interpreting exam anxiety as anxiety about castration. Theoretically, not just therapists but anyone who grasps the principles of behaviorism can make people exhibit different behaviors to help them. Teachers use it to develop student study habits, employers use it to increase employees' engagement at work, and advertisers use it to boost customer purchases. With such widespread applications, behaviorism stayed relevant. By the way, John B. Watson, the proponent of behaviorism, eventually left academia and went into the advertising industry. What happens when behaviorism is taken to the extreme? Later behaviorism guru B. F. Skinner wrote a novel called Walden II, in which he imagined a utopian-like small society where children, upon birth, didn't live with their parents but were raised by experts according to behaviorist principles. The goal was to turn them into productive members of society quickly. When you hear this, you might feel a bit uneasy, and I can't help but shudder at Skinner's vision. I don't doubt the good intentions behind this design, but it also represents a form of powerful and precise control. Who can guarantee that this control is only for the betterment of individuals? Isn't it possible that it could cause harm to individuals as well? Where behaviorism is overbearing now, let's talk about why I say behaviorism is overbearing. I have two points to make. First, in the eyes of behaviorists, individuals are mere tools for stimuli and responses, and tools don't have their thoughts and will. The individual's thoughts are unimportant, and this poses a risk. For example, there is an aversion therapy used in behavior therapy to treat addictive behaviors. The principle behind aversion therapy is to add some unpleasant stimuli following the addictive behavior. For instance, when someone is trying to quit drinking, they might be administered a drug called disulfiram. This drug causes nausea, vomiting, and discomfort when the person consumes alcohol. Over time, the individual associates alcohol with these negative sensations and becomes averse to it. This therapy is undoubtedly effective, but it's also possible for someone to, in pursuit of their own interests, make another person develop aversion to something without their knowledge or consent. Another example can be seen in modern times in the field of game design. Games are expertly designed to make you addicted, to keep you playing non-stop. Every monster you defeat, every level you achieve, every card you draw is designed to trigger pleasurable responses, prolonging your gaming time. But what if you don't want to spend that much time gaming? This brings us to the ethical contemplation of behaviorism. We are humans, and humans can be easily calculated and influenced, but humans should also have their own will and opinions. If I know you are trying to manipulate me using the size of a popcorn container, even if you give me a large one, I can choose not to eat a single bite. Another overbearing aspect of behaviorism is that it denies the uniqueness of individuals. Since people are just tools for stimuli and responses according to behaviorists, there's no real difference between one person and another. It's like the workers in a Charlie Chaplin film who tighten screws. Who they are doesn't matter, their appearance, thoughts, and life are insignificant. All we need from them is to efficiently and accurately tighten each screw. The era when behaviorism was predominant coincided with the urbanization and industrialization of the United States. This is not a coincidence. The industrial production of that time relied heavily on assembly lines, where each person was like a component on the production line. 
managers only required them to provide their instrumental value and didn't appreciate their unique personalities. Behaviorism became dominant in such an era, and it's easier to understand why. In today's context, we instinctively feel wary of these ideas. Nobody wants to be reduced to a mere symbol or a tool, devoid of any characteristics beyond the reactions they can produce. Due to these overbearing aspects, despite the usefulness of behaviorism, it's essential to recognize the potential for abuse. In practice, there's a crucial element of informed consent in the application of behaviorism. As I mentioned earlier, in the context of quitting alcohol, patients must understand what the therapy entails and make an informed decision about whether they want to undergo such changes. Only in this way can behaviorist therapy be ethical. To sum up our lesson, Behaviorism is a simplified psychological idea that reduces all psychological phenomena to the connection between external stimuli and responses. Through this approach, it gained remarkable predictive and control abilities. But ensuring that these abilities are used to help people rather than manipulate and harm them requires careful ethical consideration. As I mentioned earlier, behaviorism dominated the field of psychology until the 1950s and 1960s. In the next lesson, I'll take you to the next stop on the map of psychology knowledge, the cognitive revolution.